There have been times, like the morning before I wrote that poem, when I know where faith becomes more than just faith, where I know I'm part of something beyond my understanding. So those kind of moments that are not frequent have a profound impact. So I think it's very important. I will say that I do a lot of praying, and I always say before I pray, Lord, I believe. Lord, help my own belief. It's a question for Victoria. Yes. How did you manage, you know, taking care of your mom and, and Hank and how did you just work through that period, and what did you do for yourself? Well, I have to say I'm a lawyer, and one thing that I think lawyers in private practice learn is a lot of um, a lot of multitasking. Uh, so I learned to be very, very organized to try and schedule things, but to be, if I may say, aggressive. I think that if I hadn't been advocating for both my mother and for Hank, that we wouldn't have been seeing 80 doctors. And frankly, we had to go that far to get the help that he needed. Uh, in addition, we pursued things like being in clinical trials. Uh, and just three weeks ago, the Boston Brain, Brain, Brain Bank announced the first autopsy of an NFL player that had the misfolded tau in a different part of the brain. The part that isn't the cognitive, but the behavioral and movement piece. So that may be Hank's story eventually, but unless we all keep moving the scientific ball forward, volunteering in that way, and it's, it's not easy. I had to make all the appointments. We had to do 10 hours of questionnaires. I had to take him for the exams, but we consider this as a team very important. In addition, at the beginning, I said to him, Hank, either you're going to have to tell people what you're going through, or you're going to have to choose to keep it very private. Mm -hmm. As Hank's sister Betsy knows, and her, her brother-in-law Sean knows, Hank can't keep a secret <laughs> about anything. If you want a secret, don't tell it to him. <laughs> um, so in any case, uh, he decided he was going to be very open uh, with, with his condition. And so that made it easier for me to support him. I have to be honest about that. So I could go to the caregivers group where Evelyn and I were involved and I could talk about this situation and have people help me. I also got myself a personal trainer who would work with me by Zoom. So I still, twice a week, I go up and do my Zoom and Hank knows he's not allowed to come in and work out when I'm doing my one hour. So he's not in the background when I'm trying to do my meditation. Yes. Were you still practicing during that period? Um, I was practicing at the beginning. I, I now have retired. My law firm has mandatory retirement, but I have a small charitable consulting practice. And as Emory Aronson knows, I'm on eight nonprofit boards. My specialty was nonprofit law. And I would say that those boards call on me a lot for advice and involvement. <laughs> about, about to the amount of a full time job. Pro bono. <laughs> So what normally comes first? Is it the art that then motivates you to get the poem in this, or is it the poem is what drives what the art ends up looking like? No, the, the poem always comes later. You know, I, I, I do whatever I do, uh, and then I put the poem in. I think, well, what poetry might be appropriate for this? I did try the opposite approach, and it's in the back there, and you'll see that it looks like a mistake to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking there were a lot of mistakes. It's, like, it's, a, it's a 
black uh, pool, but, uh, uh, or is supposed to be. But, um, then he wrote a poem called The Black Pool. I had the poem first, and oh, I wanted yeah. to include that poem, so I was trying to work out a black pool. Uh, and, but I've learned that, you know, I, I've really, this has been great dealing with perfectionism, which I have had a problem with. Because nothing is perfect. Only God. <laughs> Elizabeth. So I'll just tell the people who don't know me. I'm Elizabeth, and I'm Hank's um, sister-in-law. And so I'm just kind of curious, Hank, since I've you know, been along for this journey. It really seemed to me that when you found poetry, or getting more and more involved in poetry, that it seemed to help you heal. And you make a lot of progress, and as you're writing a lot of poetry, I'm curious what you would say about that relationship between doing more poetry in your own field, do you feel like it has played a role? Well, I, I think that it's, it's, there's a combination of factors and definitely one of the, the elements that has helped me heal. But I was getting some great physical therapy, um, emotional therapy. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's all, everything that surrounds writing poetry because you're interacting with people. And there could be moments, you know, after there could be moments where, where I'm not feeling well and then I come to an event like this, force myself to come to an event like this and I start feeling better. It's like the first time Nassim took me to a walk. To a walk. Uh, she said, come on, Hank, you can do this. And I was very tenuous, and she said, uh, now as fast as you can, start counting back by threes from 100. And you know, I, I, and then after I'd done that, she said, okay, now give me five uh, states on the West Coast, the East Coast, the middle of the country. Before I knew it, I'd done, you know, eight laps around the track, small track. But so there is that element of distraction, too, that is uh, surprising. But I think it builds new neural pathways. Um, yeah. And I think that's really important. I think it helps with word finding. Uh, and we're big word believers finding. in neuroplasticity. Because you know how he, if he'd been left the way he was in 2016, he would have been just lying in bed, despondent. And, well, and you know, and, and also, I, I have challenged myself now since August 31st to write a poem every day, wow. uh, which I managed to do this morning. A poem about not looking forward to the traffic. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's challenging, but it's also rewarding. I had the great pleasure of being a Princeton student with these two remarkable Brainiacs, and you will take no umbrage, drop dead gorgeous Victoria. Every co ed was cray cray, <laughs> you know that, but if you were so modest, but don't, and, and I don't know how to I that I so, yeah, anyway, but um, your voice to me is such a revelation. The fact that you never, I know you were so busy with your athletics, but your voice. The purity of it. First of all, you sound about 22 when you sing. There is not an iota of tremulousness, no unwanted vibrato. It is so pure. It's amazing to me that the extent of your shower was was the extent. Of it. That's that's amazing. I mean, because your voice is just remarkable. Well, I'm going to keep that in mind next no. time. I <laughs> <laughs> was approach the microphone to sing with. With terror. <laughs> so you were just spread so thin so that you were never singing in a Lutheran choir or as a kid or nothing no, like that. No, no you can't choir. read music. You can't read right. No, right. that no prohibits me. But I, I would say my view is that his voice got better after he was in the hospital all those times. I don't know if something caused his voice to change, but and the fact that he can sing in public, right. I find absolutely astonishing because he never did anything like that. Not even singing Christmas carols at friends' holiday parties. But the so. clarity and also the youth of it, because you know, a, a, a voice can age and it's so good, but it's tremulous. Or, but 
just so kudos. So don't know where that came yeah, from. I don't say God, but <laughs> thank you. Thank Amazing you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. We're so appreciative of your friendship and kindness. Even the people we just met today, thank you for coming. And thank you for the